Welcome back to Maniac McGee. Today we start on part two. Now this book has three parts and you'll discover why as we get to the end. We left off with Maniac leaving town with the Cobras on one side and um, the, uh, uh, Mc the Cobras and then Big McNabb on the other side. So they have the whites on one side, the blacks on the other, and he's walking down the middle of the street and leaving town. So this is part two, chapter 22. If you were the baby buffalo at the Elmwood Park Zoo, maybe it would have gone something like this. You woke up, you have breakfast, compliments of mother's milk. You mosey on over to the lean-to. Surprise, a strange new animal's there. Bigger than you, but a lot smaller than mom. Hair, but only on the top of its head sitting in the straw, munching on a carrot, like mom does. Every morning, same thing. You get to expect it. Some mornings you forget mom's milk and you head right on over to the lean-to. The creature offers you a carrot, but all you know how to do to deal with is milk. You nuzzle the new, funny-smelling, hairy-headed animal. It nuzzles you back. Mom doesn't seem to mind. After nuzzling, the stranger climbs over the fence and goes away not to return until night. Only one morning, the stranger falls from the fence and lies on the ground on the other side. It doesn't move. You try to poke your nose through the chain links, but you can't reach. You can only watch, only watch. The old man was bumping through the zoo in the park pickup when he spotted the body clumped outside the buffalo pen. He wheeled over and got out. A kid! At first, he could only stare at the body and then at the baby bison, whose large brown eyes seemed to be watching them both. The mother came lumbering over, nodding, as if to confirm, a kid. The kid looked terrible. His clothes were scraps, rags. Wherever his body showed through, it was bony and dirty and scratched. The two bison, staring, staring, seemed to say, well, do something. The old man gathered his own bones and muscles as best he could, and he managed to hoist the kid and get him into the pickup. He laid him on the seat, bent his legs so he could close the door. He knew he should take the kid straight to the hospital or a doctor, someplace official, someplace right. But the pickup just sort of steered itself back to the band shell. Now the band shell is kind of a uh, outdoor bandstand like we have, except it's enclosed and it has a lower part to it. And there he was, lugging the kid into the baseball equipment room. The season was over by now, but the army green burlap bag still stood ready for the next ump to call. Play ball! He yanked out a couple of chest protectors and laid the kid down, careful with his head. At least he was breathing. Though it wasn't cold, it seemed as if the kid ought to be covered. So the old man took his winter work jacket off the hook and laid it over him. Then he waited and watched. With trembling, dusty fingers, he touched the kid's limp, scrawny hand. He'd never held, never really touched a kid's hand before. Hey! The kid's voice was barely a squeak, but it threw him back and he dropped the hand. Where am I? The old man cleared his throat. The band shell. The band shell? In the back, the equipment room. The kid's eyes squinted and blinked. And you? What about me? Who are you? Grayson. Grayson, do I know you? He got up. I guess you do now. He went to his hot plate and heated up some water and made some chicken noodle cup of soup. He gave it to the kid who was sitting up now. You want a spoon? He looked as though he could hardly lift the cup. He held it with both hands and gulped it down. Huh, he said. Never mind, are you still hungry? The kid flopped back down. A little. Wait here, said Grayson, and he left. Ten minutes later, he was back with a zep, a large. It took the kid less time to polish it off than it had taken Grayson to go get it. He told the kid not to eat so fast that he'd get sick. The kid nodded. Grayson said, Where'd you get them scratches? Oh, some picker bush. What were you doing there? 
Hiding. Hiding? Who from? Some kids. Where? The kid pointed. Somewhere out there. Some other town. He crossed his legs Indian style on the chest protector. Can I ask you a favor? Shoot. Can you go somewhere and get me some butterscotch crimpets? Grayson squawked. Crimpets? You still hungry? For them I am. Grayson threw the greasy Zep wrapper into the wastebasket. I don't know. Maybe you ought to do something for me first. Like what? Like, tell me your name. It's Jeffrey McGee. And where do you live? Well, I did live on Sycamore Street, 728. Did? I guess I don't anymore. The old man stared. You said Sycamore? Yep. Ain't that the East End? Yep. With his fingernail, he scraped a path of dirt off the kid's forearm. He stared at it. What are you doing? The kid asked. I'm seeing if you's white under there. Neither spoke for a while. At last, the kid said, Anything else you want to ask me? The old man shrugged. Guess not. Aw, oh, come on. Don't stop asking. I'm asked out. How about the zoo, huh? Do you want to know what I'm doing at the zoo at the buffalo pen? The old man sighed. Okay, what? I'm living there. With the buffaloes? Yep, with the buffaloes. You like buffaloes? It was dark when I got there. I thought it was the deer pen. They switched the deer and the buffaloes around last month. Oh, it's okay with me. I got along better with the buffaloes anyway. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the old man sniffed. You sure do smell like one. The kid laughed. They both laughed. When they finally calmed down, the kid said, Any chance of those crimpets now? Grayson reached for the pickup keys. Let's go. Chapter 23. Grayson got the crimpets all right. He brought back a whole box of three packs with 10 packs to a box. Now that was 30 butterscotch crimpets. Maniac thought he must have climbed out of that buffalo pen right into heaven. Then Grayson took Maniac home. Home for the old man was the Two Mills YMCA. He lived in a room on the third floor. But he didn't take Maniac up there. He took him downstairs to the locker room. He got him a towel and a cake of soap and told him to take off his rags and pointed the way to the showers. Maniac stood in the shower for an hour. He hadn't done this since his last bath with the little ones. He smiled at the thought of them shrieking and splashing. The shower needles stung his scratches, but it was a good welcome back to town stinging. When Maniac finally forced himself from the shower, he found the old man waiting with clothes. Grayson's clothes. I called the U.S. Army to haul them buffalo rags away, he said. They come in with gas masks on and they used tongs to pick them up and put them in a steel box, and they took the box away to bury it at the bottom of the first mine shaft they come to. Maniac couldn't stop laughing. Neither could Grayson, especially when he got a load of the kid drowning in his clothes. An hour later, after a minor shopping spree, Maniac had clothes of his own. For the rest of the afternoon, they cruised around town, talking and eating crumpets. So, said the old man, now where are you going to go? What you gonna do? Maniac thought it over. How about a job? I could work for the park like you. Grayson didn't answer that. He said, where do you think you're gonna stay? Maniac's idea was prompt. The baseball room, it's perfect. A tiny idea was beginning to worm its way into Grayson's head. He could barely feel it as it brushed by all the claptrap in his brain. He ignored it. He said, what about school? Maniac was silent. Some butterscotch icing had stayed behind on a wrapper. He scooped it up and mopped it from his finger, wishing it were Mrs. Beale's and not his own. Grayson, who was not comfortable asking questions, was less comfortable waiting for answers. I said, what about school? Maniac turned to him. What about it? You gotta go, you're a kid, ain't you? I'm not going. But you gotta, don't you? They'll make you. Not if they don't find me. 
The old man just looked at him for a while with a mixture of puzzlement and recognition, as though the fish he had landed might be the same one he'd thrown away long before. Why, he said. Maniac felt why more than he knew why. It had to do with homes and families and schools and how a school seems sort of like a big home, but only a day home because then it empties out and you can't stay there at night because it's not really a home. And you could never use it as your ad address because an address is where you stay at night, where you walk right in the front door without knocking, where everybody talks to each other and uses the same toaster. So all the other kids would be heading for their homes, their night homes, each of them, hundreds flocking from school like birds from a tree, scattering across town, each breaking off his or her own place, each knowing exactly where to land, school, home. No, he was not gonna have one without the other. If you try to make me, he said, I'll just start running. Grace had said nothing. What the kids said actually made him feel good though he had no idea why. And the brushing little worm of a notion was beginning to tickle him now. He kept on driving. Chapter 24. They got back to the band shell just as they finished the last of the crimpets. Grayson looked at his watch. Guess it's time to quit the job I never did today. Time for dinner, too. Grayson was joking, but Maniac was serious when he piped. Great, where to? Dumbfounded, the old man drove back out of the park to the nearest diner, where he sat with a cup of coffee, while the boy wolfed down meatloaf and gravy, mashed potatoes, zucchini, salad, and coconut custard pie. Grayson had a way of jumping into a subject without warning. It was during Maniac's dessert that he abruptly said, Them black people, do they eat mashed potatoes too? Maniac thought he was kidding, and then he realized he wasn't. Sure, Mrs. Beale used to have potatoes a lot, mashed and every other way. Mrs. Who? Mrs. Beale, do you know the Beals of 728 Sycamore Street? The old man shook his head. Well, they were my family. I had a mother and a father and a little brother and a sister and a sister my age and a dog and my own room too. Grayson stared out the diner window as if digesting this information. How about meatloaf? Huh? Do they eat meatloaf? Well, sure, they eat meatloaf too, and peas, and corn, and you name it. Cake? Maniac beamed. Oh, man, you kidding. Mrs. Beale makes the best cakes in the world. Grayson's eyes narrowed. Toothbrushes. Do they use them? Maniac fought not to smile. Absolutely. We all had our toothbrushes hanging in the bathroom. I know that, said Grayson, impatient. But is theirs the same as ours? No difference that I could see. You didn't drink out of the same glass. Well, absolutely we did. This information seemed to shock the old man. Maniac laid down his fork. Grayson, they're just regular people like us. I was never in a house of theirs. Well, I'm telling you, it's the same. There's bathtubs and refrigerators and rugs and TVs and beds. Grayson was wagging his head. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? It was after dark when they got back to the baseball equipment room. The worm in Grayson's head had long since ceased to be a tiny tickle. It was now a maddening itch. As with all such itch worms, it would exit by only one route, the mouth. He said, um, I was thinking that maybe you'd want to come over to my place. This here floor is pretty hard. He tapped his foot to show how hard. The grizzled old park hand could never know how much Maniac was tempted or how deeply the offer touched him. Neither could Maniac explain that the bad luck he always seemed to have with parents had led him to the conclusion that he just better stick to himself. What's well, not bad here, he said. Look, he laid down on the chest protectors and closed his eyes. It's just like a mattress. I can feel myself dozing off already. And then not wanting to hurt the old man's feelings, he quickly added. Hey, I told you everything about me. How about you? He pulled Grayson's coat over himself. A bedtime story. Grayson snorted. Story? I don't know no stories. Sure you do, maniac prodded. About yourself, you know, about you. Everybody has a story. Not me, 
Grayson was edging for the door. I ain't got no story. I ain't nobody. I work at the park. Do you line baseball fields? Yep, I do that. You live at the Y. You drive the park pickup. You like butterscotch crimpets. Grayson shook his head. Well, not as much as you. I was just eating them to be friendly, so you wouldn't have to eat them all by yourself. And there's another thing about you, Maniac joked. You're a liar. They both laughed. Grayson opened the door. Wait, called Maniac. What did you want to grow up to be when you were a kid? Grayson paused in the doorway. He looked into the, out into the night. A baseball player, he said. He turned out the light and closed the door. Chapter 25 In the morning, Grayson bought Maniac an Egg McMuffin and a large orange juice. He bought the same thing for himself, so they ate breakfast together in the baseball equipment room. You sent me to bed without a story last night, Maniac kidded. Grayson brushed a yellow speck of egg from his white stubble. I don't got no stories, I told you. You wanted to be a baseball player? Well, that ain't no story. Well, did you become one? Grayson drank half his orange juice. Just the miners, he muttered. Maniac, yup, the miners? Couldn't, couldn't make it to the majors. There was a frayed weariness in the old man's words, as though they had long since worn out. Grayson, the miners? Man, you must have been good. What position did you play? Grayson said, pitcher. This word, unlike the others, was not worn at all, but fresh and robust. It startled Maniac. It declared, I'm not what you see. I am not a line land, pick up driving, live at the Y, bean brain park hand. I am not rickety, whiskered worm chow. I am a pitcher. Maniac had sensed there was something more to the old man. Now he knew what it was. Grayson, what's your first name? The old man fidgeted. Earl. But call me Grayson, like everybody. He looked at the clock on the wall. I gotta go. Grayson, wait. I'm late for work. You ought to be in school. And he was gone. Grayson returned at noon, bringing zeps and sodas, and was not allowed to leave until he told Maniac one story about the minor leaks. So he told the kid about his first day in the minors with Bluefield, West Virginia, in the Appalachian League, Class D. Can't get no lower than that, he told the kid. That's where you broke in. We don't have D-ball no more. Now, minor leagues is a lot like the Peoria Chiefs. Feeds into a major league team. He told about thumbing a ride to Bluefield, and when he got there, going up to a gas station attendant and asking which way to the ballpark. And the gas station man told him, sure, but first I gotta ask you something. You're a new ball player, right? Just coming on board? And Grayson said, yep, that's right. And the man said, I thought so. Well then, you're just gonna have to make your first stop right over there. And he pointed across the street. That there restaurant, the Blue Star. You go right on in there and sit down and tell the waitress you want the biggest steak on the menu and everything else you want because it's all on the house. The Blue Star treats every new rookie to his first meal in town for free. He gave a wink. They want your business. Great, thought Grayson, and he did just that. Only when he got up and left, the restaurant owner came running after him down the street, all mad at Grayson for skipping out. And when Grayson told him that he was a rookie picking up his first free meal, the owner got even madder. Seems the gas station man was a real card and liked to welcome dumb rookies with his little practical joke. And that's how it came to be that when the Bluefield Bullets took the field that day, they did so without the services of their new pitcher, who was back in the kitchen of the Blue Star restaurant doing dishes to work off a 16-ounce steak, half a broiled chicken, and two pieces of rhubarb pie. After a story like that, Maniac couldn't just stay behind, so he tagged along with Grayson when he went back to work. He helped the old man raise a new fence around the children's petting farmyard. When the park superintendent came around and asked about the kid, Grayson said it was his nephew who'd come to visit for a while. The superintendent who managed the budget said, now we can't pay him, you know. And Grayson said, that's fine, no problem. And that was that. From then on, Maniac was on the job with Grayson every afternoon. They raised fences and mended fences, all stone, 
patched asphalt, painted, trimmed trees. They ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, sometimes in the equipment room and sometimes at a restaurant. They spent their weekends together. All the while, Grayson told baseball stories, insisting all along, I ain't got no stories. He told about the Appalachian League and the Carolina League and the Pecos Valley League and the Buckeyes and the Mexican Leagues, about the Paducah Twin Oaks and the Natchez Pelicans and the Jessup Georgia Browns and the Laredo Lariats, all minor league teams, minor league baseball. Sleazy hotels, sleazy buses, sleazy stadiums, sleazy fans, sleazy water buckets, Curved balls and bus fumes and dreams. Dreams of the majors, clean sheets, and umpire at every base. Funny stories, happy stories, sad stories, and just plain baseball stories. The happiest story being the one about Willie Mays, very last at bat in the minor leagues before he went up to the New York Giants and immortality. Well, it was old Grayson himself who had the last crack at Mays in the ninth inning of a game with Indianapolis. And what did Grayson do? All he did was set the say hey kid down swinging on three straight curveballs. The saddest story was the one about the scout who came down from the Toledo Mud Hens. The Mud Hens had a roster slot and the scout had a notion to fill it with a pitcher with the wicked curveball name of Earl Grayson. This was Grayson's big chance for the Mud Hens were class triple A ball one short step from the majors. The night before the game, Grayson spent half of it on his knees by his bed praying. And even five minutes before the game in the dugout, he bent down pretending to tie his shoe and he closed one eye and prayed, please let me win this ball game. Which was something since he'd never gone to church in his life. God must have fainted, he said to Maniac. And indeed, maybe God did, or maybe he only listened to major leaguers because Grayson took the mound and proceeded to pitch the flat out awfulest game of his life. His curveball wasn't curving, his sinker wasn't sinking, his knuckler wasn't knuckling. The batters were teeing off as if it were the invasion of Normandy Beach. Before the third inning was over, the score was 12 to nothing and Grayson was in the showers. He was 27 years old then and that was the closest he would ever get to the big show. He hung on for 13 more years, a baseball junkie winding up in some hot tamale league in Guanajuato, Mexico, until his curveball could no longer bend around so much as a chili pepper, and his fastball was slower than a senorita's answer. He was 40, out of baseball, and for all intents and all purposes, out of life. All those years in the game and all he was fit to do was clean a restroom or sweep a floor or lay a chalk line, or far, far down the road, tell stories to a wide-eyed homeless kid. Chapter 26. It was impossible to listen to such stories empty-handed. As soon as Grayson started one, Maniac would reach into one of the equipment bags and pull out a ball or a bat or a catcher's mitt. Sniffing the scuffed horse-eyed aroma of the ball, rippling the fingertips over the red stitching, it's hard to say how these things can make the listening better, but they do, and for Maniac, they did. And of course, as happens with baseball, one thing led to another, and pretty soon the two of them were tossing a ball back and forth. And then they were outside, where the throws could be longer, where you could play pepper on the outfield grass of the Legion field. The old man pitching, the kid tapping grounders, where you could shag fungos, the old man popping high flyers, the kid chasing him down. And now the stories were mixed with instruction. The grizzled, rickety coot showing the kid how to spray liners to the opposite field, how to get a jump on a long fly even before the batter hits it, how to throw the curve ball. Stiff, crooked fingers that grappled clumsily with crimpet wrappers curled naturally around the shape of a baseball. With a ball in his hand, the park handyman became a professor. As to the art of pitching, of course, the old man could show and tell, but he could no longer do, except for one pitch, the only one left in his repertoire from the old days. He called it the stop ball, and it nearly drove Maniac goofy. 
The old man claimed he'd discovered the stop ball one day down in a Texas league and that he was long gone from baseball when he perfected it. Unlike most pitches, the stop ball involved no element of surprise. On the contrary, the old man would always announce it. Okay, he'd call from the mound. Here she comes. Now keep your eye on her because she's going to float on up there and just about the time she's over the plate, she's going to stop. Now nobody else ever hit it, so don't go upsetting yourself if you don't neither. It's no shame to whiff off the stop ball. And then he'd throw it. Well, of course, Maniac knew that most of, not, not all of that was Blarney. And just to make sure, he watched the ball extra carefully. There sure didn't seem to be anything unusual about it, not at first anyway. But as the ball came closer, it did somehow seem to get more and more peculiar. And by the time it reached the plate, it might as well have stopped because Maniac never knew if he was swinging at the old man's pitch or at his speech. Whatever, in weeks of trying, he never hit it out of the infield. It was October. The trees rimming the outfield were flaunting their colors. The kid and the geezer baseballed their lunchtimes away and after dinner times and weekends. And every night, as the old man left for his room at the Y, he would grouse. You gotta go to school. And one night the kids said back, I do. And that's how the old man found out what the kid was doing with his mornings. He noticed the books before, rows and piles of them kept growing. But there being books, he didn't think much of it. Now the kid tells him, you know the money you give me? Each morning he gave the kid 50 cents or a dollar to get himself some crimpets. Well, I take it up at the library. Right inside the door, they have these books they're selling. Cases of them, old books they don't want anymore. They only cost five or 10 cents a piece. He pointed to the piles. I buy them. He showed them to the old man. Ancient back broken math books, flaking travel books, warped spellers, mangled mysteries, biographies, music books, astronomy books, cookbooks. What's the matter, said the old man. Can't you make up your mind what kind you want? The kid laughed. I want them all. He threw his hands out. I'm learning everything. He opened up one of the books. Look, geometry, triangles, okay? Isosceles triangles. These two legs, they look equal to you. The old man squinted and he nodded. Okay, but can you prove it? The old man studied the triangle for a full minute. If I had a ruler, maybe. No ruler. The old man sighed. Well, I guess I give up. So the kid proved it. Absolutely, dead center proved it. Two days later, while playing Pepper in the Legion infield, the old man said to the kid, So, why don't you go ahead and teach me how to read? <laughs>